Sarah. I've always been an activist, really, my whole life. I was brought up in an activist family in quite a difficult area in Liverpool under the Thatcher era with a militant council, so quite an interesting place to grow up. I was squatting age five in local housing to try and keep it. We were fighting for health centres. Um, always been passionate to make the world a better place and help people fulfil their potential when I could see that people were working really hard, but there were structures keeping them from fulfilling their potential. In school, I was um, voted in to be head girl from my peers, which I don't think my teachers were um, excited about. And we campaigned to get lockers, and we campaigned um, to get recycling, and we won them. Um, we also campaigned to eradicate gym knickers from the PE <laughs> uniform, and we lost. So I learned a lot from that. Um, in university, I campaigned on global issues and local issues, and I even did my dissertation on liberation theology and how it linked to what was happening in Everton with the local churches and local people, and was a big geek about activism and how to be the change you wish to see in the world, really. And then luckily managed my whole career has been working in campaigns for different charities and mobilizing people. So three years ago, when I felt like a complete burnt-out activist, I was really shocked that I actually was thinking, maybe activism isn't for me, maybe I can't do it, maybe I just am not the type of person that can do it, and maybe I don't fit into that mould of how to be a good activist. At the same time, I got into craft. I got into cross-stitch and hand embroidery and really loved it. I used to love um, painting and doing drawings, but my job was really chaotic and I was traveling a lot. So I needed to do something creative and I found that I could do cross-stitch and hand embroidery on the train um, and in small spaces like my poxy little flat in London and really liked the creativity of it. And I wanted to you know, use that fire in my belly to still be campaigning on, on injustice issues, but was really tired. So today, I want to talk to you about three problems I found with the activism world and the reality of it, if, of it today, but also a tool that I found that helped me to become a happy and healthy craftivist. So for the southerners in the room, that's craftivist. <laughs> So you might be thinking, what is craftivism? Well, it was coined by a lovely lady called Betsy Greer in 2003, and she defined it as, my memory's really bad, um, a way of looking at life where voicing opinions through creativity makes your voice stronger, your compassion deeper, and your quest for justice more infinite. And because I felt like a burnt-out activist and didn't feel like I fitted into that way of doing traditional activism, and I loved craft, I thought, like I always think, if I've got a passion and a talent for something, how can I use it for good? So I googled craft and activism, and that term popped up, and I thought, brilliant. So I contacted Betsy and said, this is amazing, I love it, I love what you're saying that it is, are there any groups I can join, are there any projects I can do? And she contacted me back saying, no, my website's all about documenting how craft has been used in history with the suffragettes and Chilean women and what's been going on throughout history and what's happening now, but there isn't, we don't provide that tool. So I thought, um, well, all right, I'm going to do something and check if she thinks it's happy to be called craftivism. So I started doing lots of projects and it felt like craft and activism for me really fitted well together. And one of the main, one of the first things that really drained me of energy as an activist was that I felt like I was doing loads all the time. You know, as a campaigner, you always get told, great, you want a campaign, join this group, go on this march, sign this petition, go do this, do, 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 do. And because the world, sadly, is quite messed up, there's always loads to do. And I did loads, and I got completely knackered and didn't feel like I was achieving much. Um, but with craft, craft is naturally slow, so for me, it it made me slow down, it made me focus on what I was doing, and with craft, with hand embroidery, like cross-stitch and different stitches, it's very repetitive and you're using your hands, so it naturally helps you reflect on things, and it helps you meditate because it is very repetitive. So when I link that in with thinking about justice issues and stitching about justice issues, it made me think for hours and it really helped me focus in this busy world that we're in now to really think about those issues and think about 
what they mean to me, how I feel like I could make any difference as a voter, as a consumer, as a, you know, a constituent, as a campaigner, as a friend, as a colleague. You know, how can I help these enormous issues that are happening? How can I be part of the solution rather than part of the problem? And for me, I felt like craft was the only thing that really forced me to stop and think, and I didn't feel like the activism world really offered that to me. So the fact that craft makes you stop and think and reflect, and it uses your hands, your head, and your heart, and when you link that in with justice issues, for me, it just clicked, and I thought, brilliant, I like this. The second thing for me was that I always felt like as a campaigner, our default was always to be really negative. It was always to preach at people and say, we're right, you're wrong, you should do this, I'm going to shout at you until you do that, I'm going to bully you, I'm going to demonize you. And for me, like lots of people, that's really draining. You know, if you're always thinking about the negatives and not striving for the positives, it's quite uncomfortable to do. And as a typical campaigner, I was um, contacting my MP on email, um, saying, you know, signing these petitions and sending them to her. And she got back to me, actually, and told me to stop. And she said, yeah, I know. She said, um, I want you to stop campaigning. This is a waste of your time, my time, and charity's money. And I thought, what? You're not a very good MP for telling me to do that. But actually, it was really good, because she made me think, actually, I'm not talking to her. I'm talking at her. I'm just telling her what to do. I'm treating her like a robot, a bit like how I felt as an activist. I was new to the area. I didn't know much about what she was all about and what her passions were. And she didn't know much about me, so she didn't know that all these campaigns I was doing quick and easy clicktivism and slacktivism for, I actually really cared about them. So I decided to make her a handkerchief, as you do. Um, and here's a copy of it that I use in workshops, because she's got the real one, which is up there. So I stitched on the handkerchief, Dia, my MP, which is her name, but I'm not going to tell you who she is. As my MP, I'm asking you to please use your powerful position to challenge injustice, change structures keeping people poor, and fight for a more just and fair world. I know being an MP is a big and tough job, but please don't blow it. This is your chance to start <laughs> to make a real positive difference. Yours in hope, Sarah. And then I had my postcode so she knew I was a constituent. So I booked in to meet her, and she had to meet me, and I gave her this hanky, and I said, I'm the one who's been sending you all these campaign issues, and I want to tell you about what I'm passionate about and how all of the campaigns I'm sending you fit under this umbrella of social justice and inequality that I'm passionate about, but I also want to know what you're passionate about and how I can be the best constituent and how I can challenge you to be the best MP um, and keep you on the right track, and we can sort of work together where possible and be critical friends to each other where possible as well. And when I contact her now, I always refer to my MP, to my handkerchief in all correspondence to her, and she does the same, and we know each other, and we, because I gave her this crafty thing that's quite messy on the back, and that clearly took me a long time, it helped me build a relationship with her, which, as a traditional activist, I never really got a chance to build that connection and to know a lot about. She's very honest with me now about what she can and can't do, and it's really useful information as a campaigner, so you can be much more strategic in what you do. And all of our projects are very positive, so we always start from how the world is a beautiful place and look at this amazing event that's happening, but we can make it better, and there's also some crap stuff going on as well. Um, so we always start from that position, and we do everything small, so again, it's not attacking people, it's not preaching at people, it's not a giant banner that people have to avoid to go past you. You don't have a giant megaphone in your hand so people just you know, don't want to listen to you and just switch off. It's always provoking people to think, it doesn't tell people what to do, and it's always very positive and encouraging and trying to get people to be their best selves. The third thing that I struggled with traditional forms of activism was, I hinted at the beginning, was I really didn't feel like I fitted in as an activist. I'm not a natural extrovert, um, hence the nervous laughter. <laughs> um, and 
I don't always like being around a lot of people. I quite like doing stuff on my own. I actually get really drained from being around large groups in big parties. I like to think quite deeply on my own or be around people. I don't like dressing up. I don't like shouting. I'm scared of riding a bike, so lots of some activists don't like me there. I'm not a vegan. I love fashion. There was lots of reasons I didn't feel like I fitted in <laughs> to the activism world. Um, so. For me, I, wanted, I want activism to thread through my whole life. I don't want it just to be something I opt into once in a while to say, oh, well done me, I've done my bit for the world and buff up my halo. I want it to be in everything I do, whether I smile to people on the street, what I buy, you know, who I vote for. It should be, we should all be, everything we do should be about trying to make the world a better place and not harming it as well, which is easy to do. So what we do, is we do stuff where we craft on our own, um, on buses, in public, and with craft, people naturally want to ask you what you're doing. You're not stitching there saying to people, do you want to ask me what I'm doing? You stitch, you reflect on it, and people tend to really want to go up to you and go, oh, what are you doing? And then if you say, I'm stitching a handkerchief for a journalist who I think has got loads of power, but they're abusing it a little bit, or a banker of my friend, my mum's friend, or you know, a, a teacher who's got loads of power with their local kids to help them be the best global citizens they could be. It starts a conversation, you know, if you're stitching a mini protest banner, like our little ones we hang up, which is a quote from Gandhi or, you know, Scorsese or anyone, it causes a conversation and people feel like they've approached you, so they're much more open to have a chat with you rather than you forcing it down their throat. We also do events in public. We tend to always have it as small groups of people, again. So it's always something that we chat to each other whilst doing things. Half the time, we don't even talk to each other. We're just focusing on what we're doing. But people naturally come to us. People will Instagram what we're doing, Pinterest it, tweet about it. It means for us that activism isn't in this bubble that you have to fit into anymore. It's part of everyday life, and it's getting people to think on their own and take ownership of issues. And we do big events as well. So this one is in the Haywood, when um, the Haywood asked us to do an event with, um, as part of the Tracy Emin quilt exhibition. And we were told to do something that linked in with that. So we had a giant love letter talking about her exhibition was about love and very much about her love for individuals and individual love and quite self-centered. So we focused on global love and what it means to show your love and got people stitching about that. And we crammed in, 70 people came and wouldn't leave. And it was the, the biggest event they'd had in that area. And people were tweeting like weeks beforehand saying, I'm going to the Tracy Emin exhibition because I love craft. So I'm going to go see her quilts. But I'm definitely going on this day because I want to do the thing with the craftivists as well. So we got a lot of buzz around it. And again, we really want activism to be outside of the activist bubble. So we get loads of slack from a lot of activists, sadly, who say, why aren't you at Occupy or why don't you come along to this, you know, feminist meeting or this zine fest? And there's not enough time in the world, so we really focus on being places where you might not normally find it. So we work a lot with different organizations like the Tate and art institutions as well as craft institutions. We got 5,000 people as part of Secret Cinema to stitch as prisoners, thinking about injustice issues, thinking about how the crime that they'd committed, um, how to reflect on that, to exercise that inner monologue, which often, if you don't, can mean that people get very violent or end up self-harming because they're overwhelmed by things. So really got people thinking about the justice system and thinking about how craft can help with mental health as well. And like taking down those labels of what prisoners are and really getting people to be in the shoes of prisoners and think quite hard while they were stitching. Um, and working with like jewellery companies like Tatty Divine, every Valentine's Day we do a project with them where they design our little key rings that everyone makes and puts them in letters and leaves around the world. And they've got such a cult following of fashionistas and people who love their fashion to be able to link in with that audience. Again, for us, that's really powerful that we can get activism and justice issues into the everyday life. For me, activism saved me. I felt completely lost um, as an activist and felt like my reality had just disappeared and I didn't know what to do. So craftivism really saved me. It helped me reflect on issues so that I took ownership of them. Um, and so I had a strong foundation to know what to do. It helped me engage people in a conversational, respectful way so we could be critical friends with each other, but really try and make the world a better place using each other's gifts and talents and challenging each other. 
And it also meant that I didn't have to go and opt in to being an activist for some of my life and feel completely drained. I could be a craftivist. So for me, my story really is for you to think about the reality now. Are you an activist in that mold? Do you feel like you don't fit in? Does activism need to change in the reality that we're in today? And how do you think you can be the person that you are? Thank you very much.